Several years back, I had you speak at the Exponential Conference. We did a phenomenal job and was delighted to have you there. For our purposes, I thought it'd be great. Before we jump into this topic of racial reconciliation, could you just kind of tell us kind of your story? Yeah. Because what's it been? Probably three decades now you've been involved in this work. Yeah. Um, why was it? that you decide like, yeah, this is what I'm gonna give my life to and really focus my ministry on. You know, I thought about it a little bit in preparation to talk with you, and I realized that when I was in seminary at Fuller, right, Fuller Theological Seminary, Pasadena, California, before you can graduate, you gotta go practice. You gotta do a practicum, okay. right? They don't want us to destroy the church. That's a good idea. <laughs> without we, you know, having a little practice at I actually doing it. But I knew I wasn't called to pastor a local church in that way. So most people who did their practicum did it at a church. And I asked, is there another practicum I can do? Out of that question came an invitation to become the chaplain's intern at Occidental College. Mm. So I go to Occidental College, the chaplain is a relatively new believer. He has a PhD in religion, but this lived faith was new to him. So InterVarsity College students had kind of begun to come alongside the chaplain and disciple him, if that makes any sense, okay. right? Lived faith, what's that mean? Yeah, he hadn't really had a personal relationship where he had acknowledged Christ as Lord oh, okay. and Savior of his life. He theologically, intellectually understood religion, but the personal kind of transformational yeah. giving one's life to Christ, he hadn't done that. And so he was starting to learn about Bible studies and all that stuff, right? Having services where the students would worship and not just get together and talk theology. And so all of that came within a varsity. So when I got there to the chaplain's office and his, his ministry, I literally became a part of a varsity by default hmm. because they were so intertwined, right? So I go to the very first chapel, which is actually a large group a varsity meeting, and there's 200 college students in there. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And so I'm like totally impressed, but I'm surprised by the fact that only two students are students of color. Mm. One Latino young man and an African-American young man. And I felt like I was in a time warp because I became a Christian when I was a college student. Ten years prior to that, I felt the same way of isolation, the same way as a black student who had gone to InterVarsity, Campus Crusade, Navigators, and I'd be the only one, if, if, if that, mm. of a black person or a person of color in that room. And I thought to myself, and it was a question that came from my gut, what is it with the church that makes this issue of race so difficult for us to actually make progress on? It's almost as if there's been nothing that's changed from when I was a college student to 10 years later. Yeah. We've made progress on a lot of things except this. What is it? It almost felt like the prophet Jeremiah, Dave, who said, there is a bomb in Gilead. Mm -hmm. And if that's true, why are your people still sick? So at that point, then you said, okay, so the focus, after, as a result of that internship, my focus is going to be on racial reconciliation. Yes. So in your definition, I want to, I want to, I want to go a little deeper. Yeah. You, you, there's two key things you have in here. You talk about restoring both um, kind of personal relationships, but also uh, systemic, so personal brokenness, and also systemic brokenness. That's right. Um, now, why do you need both of those things for racial reconciliation to really happen? I'll tell you a story. How All about right. this? Please I do. was in Costa Rica because one day All I'm right. going to be fluent in Spanish. Yeah. One day I'm do going to Spanish? be solamente un poco. Pero wow. Nice. <laughs> it's muy importante para mí. So, yes, I can, but I'm not completely fluent. Long story short, on my way back through customs, right after a month in Costa Rica, which was wonderful, when I'm on my way back, there's two different lines, right? There is a line uh, that leads to, you know, for the United States citizens and Canadians, that's what it said, and then non-residents, right? And so I'm doing what we do, shuffling through the line, and I'm thinking about the fact that I was asked after I get back to the United States to come to, to, to um, Washington, D.C. to lobby Congress regarding immigration reform. Okay. And I said no. I said no because I didn't think I'm an expert at it. I don't like trying to advocate for something that I don't feel like I'm well-versed in, right? And I just felt like, and I'm just getting back from Costa Rica, right? So I thought I had really valid reasons for not trying to take this on. When I was in that line, I remember looking around at the diversity of both lines, both the non-resident line and the residence line, and there was a lot of 
different people from all different kinds of places. You could see it in their dress, in their facial, you know, in their racial uh, characteristics. You could also see it and hear it in their languages. And I thought, wow, our country is already diverse enough, right? And all of a sudden, I felt the Holy Spirit's tap. Mm -hmm. Like, hold on, Brenda, hold on, <laughs> Miss Reconciliation. <laughs> and um, I heard these little questions rise in my heart. Do you believe that I want the same thing for others that I want for you? Hmm. And I said, yes, Lord. Do you believe that I have enough for everyone? Yes, Lord, right? Then as I thought about it, I heard this in my heart. You can't say that you love people and not care about the policies that affect those people. Hmm. And I will tell anybody, I love Latino people, I do. Mm -hmm. I'm not just trying to speak Spanish to be cute. And I realized that I've spent a whole month in a country where I told people I love them. Now I'm being asked to come and lobby on a, a policy, a systemic issue that could actually impact lives of people that I would just was just with, who might for whatever reason want to come to this country, right? Maybe go to graduate school, maybe go to med school. And I said, no, I won't go talk about that system because I don't feel like I'm an expert. I repented instantly. Two weeks later, I was in Washington, D.C., and I was talking about immigration reform. Because you can't say you love people and not care about the policies, the systemic issues that affect their lives. So that's why I say, this is not about making a diverse friend. This is not about me learning to speak another language. It's relational and it is systemic. And those things go together because we care about policies that affect those people. I know this won't surprise you, but um, I have conversations with some of the folks in our church that are people of color. Mm -hmm. And these kind of conversations, I mean, it just gets tiring. Yeah. And actually, f for some people who are white folks who've been in this work, too, it just gets tiring. What would you say to those people? Just kind of a word of encouragement. Yeah. In 2.0, that's another big shift in this 2.0 version of the book, is that there's something called the restoration phase. Uh, and it's because I, at my church, I was going to lead the reconciliation process through this the system, you know, we're going identification or what have you. And there were people of color who said to me, we love you, Pastor Brenda. We love you. We don't want to be on another reconciliation or diversity team, because whenever we, uh, whenever there's a diversity conversation, we are the usual suspects. If there's ever somebody who has to ask a question, we are the resource person, and we don't always want to do it. We we do reconciliation all the time. Our bodies are doing work, whether we want it to or not, yeah. and it was helpful. So the restoration phase says there is a need for people to take a sabbatical, mm -hmm. to have an opportunity to rest, to restore to recharge, to reconnect to their own community, to God, right? And then someone would say, well, can a white person be in the restoration phase? Because I'm a little tired myself. And I think this, yes and no, or probably no and yes. Okay. Meaning what those people were saying is that I can't not do reconciliation. I'm conscious of my body and what is perceived no matter where I am. My husband is one of the most brilliant people I know. He has a PhD and he's the president of a graduate school. Mm. He, with all of that to his credit, is nervous sometimes about walking the dog in our neighborhood mm. because his body looks like a black man and he knows that. And we live in a neighborhood where we're not in the majority. So that cannot be compensated in, in any other way. He has to watch what yeah. is perceived of him, where a white person doesn't have that same burden, right? Yeah. But I have a student, her name is Sarah, and she gave herself to the front line of racial reconciliation. And we could see how burned out she was becoming. When a person is a real ally, they're in community with people who say to them, you got to step back. We don't want to lose you, Sarah. We love you. You need to be in the restoration phase. A person who is white is invited by the people that love of them who are in relationship with them to rest so that they can be confident. They're not wimping out. Their community sees how hard they've worked and how exhausted they are. So take a sabbatical. So take a sabbatical. And it's not that you're not reconciling. Restoration is a part of reconciling. Someone said, my existence is resistance. If I don't die out here, I'm actually got my fist up in the air. Yeah. I'm doing something to help the movement by staying alive. And that's true.